हेलो एवरीबाडी वेलकम टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल जय श्री जवाजी नेम ऑफ द बुक बाउंड्रीज वेन टू से यस हाउ टू से नो टू टेक कंट्रोल ऑफ योर लाइफ पार्ट टू बाउंड्री कॉन्फ्लिक्स यूनिट टेन बाउंड्रीज एंड योर चिल्ड्रेन कंटिन्यूस हैविंग अ सेंस ऑफ कंट्रोल एंड चॉइस आई वॉन्ट गो टू द डेंटिस्ट एंड यू कैन मेक मी गो Pamela stamped her 11 year old feet and scowled at her father Sal who was waiting at the front door. There had been a time when Sal would have reacted in a knee jerk fashion to Pamela's power move. He would have said something like, "Well, we'll see about that" and physically drag the screaming child into the car. However, lots of family counseling and reading up on these issues had prepared Sal for the inevitable. Calmly he said to her you are absolutely right honey i can't make you go to the dentist if you don't want to go you don't have to but remember our rule if you choose not to go you are also choosing not to go to the party tomorrow night i will certainly respect either decision shall i cancel your appointment pamela looked perplexed and thought a minute then slowly she replied i will go but I'm not going because I have to. Pamela was right. She was choosing to go to her appointment because she wanted to attend the party. Children need to have a sense of control and choice in their lives. They need to see themselves not as dependent, helpless pawns of the parents, but as choosing, willing, initiative taking agents of their own lives. Children begin life in a helpless, dependent fashion. Godly parenting however seeks to help children learn to think make decisions and master their environment in all aspects of life this runs the gamut of deciding what to wear in the morning to what courses to take in school learning to make age appropriate decisions helps children have the sense of security and control in their lives anxious and well meaning parents attempts to prevent their children from making painful decisions they shield them from fouling up and skinning their knees their motto is here let me decide that for you the result is that kids become atrophied in a very important part of the image of god that should be developing in their character their assertion or change making abilities children need a sense that their lives their destinies are larger theirs to determine within the province of god's sovereignty this helps them weigh choices rather than avoid them they learn to approach sorry they learn to appreciate the consequences of choices made rather than resenting the choices made for them delaying gratification of goals the world now was made for young children it's where they live try telling a 2 year old she can des- have dessert tomorrow she doesn't buy it that means never to her newborns in fact don't have the capacity to understand later that's why a 6 month old panics when mom leaves the room he is convinced that she is irrevocably gone forever yet sometime in our development we learn the value of later of delaying one good for a greater good we call this skill delay of gratification it's the ability to say no to our impulses wishes and desires for some gain down the road the scriptures play great value on this ability god uses this skill to help us see benefits of planning and preparing jesus is our prime example who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of god Generally this skill isn't relevant until after the first year of life as bonding needs take precedence during that time however teaching delay of gratification can begin quickly by the beginning of the second year dessert comes after carrots not before older children also need to learn this skill the family can't buy certain clothes or recreational items until later in the year again The boundaries developed during this process are invaluable later in life. They can prevent a child from becoming an adult who is a broken, chaotic, impulse-driven slave to Madison Avenue. Our children can become like ants who are self-sufficient instead of sluggards who are always in crisis. Learning how to delay gratification helps children have a goal orientation. 
They learn to save time and money for things that are important to them and they value what they have chosen to buy. One family I know had the son save up his money for his first car. He began with the plan with dad's help when he was 13. When all his weekend and summer jobs finally paid off in a car when he was 16, he treated that car like it was fine china, you could eat lunch off the hood. He had counted the cost and valued the result. Respecting the limits of others From an early age, children need to be able to accept the limits of parents, siblings and friends. They need to know that others don't always want to play with them, that Others may not want to watch the same TV shows they want and that others may want to eat dinner at a different restaurant than they do. They need to know that the world doesn't revolve around them. This is important for a couple of reasons. First, the ability to learn to accept limits teaches us to take responsibility for ourselves. Knowing that others are not always available for us at our beck and call helps us to become inwardly directed instead of externally driven. It helps us carry our own knapsack. Have you ever been around a child who can't hear no, who keeps whining, casually, throwing a tantrum or pouting till he gets his way? The problem is, no longer we hate and resist the limits of others, the more dependent we will be on others. We expect others to take care of us rather than simply taking care of ourselves. At any rate, God has constructed life itself to teach us this law. It's the only way we can live on this planet together. Sooner or later, someone will say a no to us that we can't ignore. It's built into the fabric of life. Observe the progression of no's in the life of the person who resists others' limits. Number one, the no of parents. Number two, the no of siblings. Number three, the no of school teachers. Number four, the no of school friends. Number five, the no of bosses and supervisors. Number six, the no of spouses. Number seven, the no of health problems from overeating, over alcoholism or an irresponsible lifestyle. Number eight, the no of police, the courts and even prison. Some people learn to accept boundaries early in life even as early as stage number one. But some people have to go all the way to number eight before they get the picture that we have to accept life's limits. Stop listening to instruction my son and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Many out of control adolescents don't mature until their thirties when they become tired of not having a steady job and a place to stay. They have to hit bottom financially and sometimes they may even have to live on the streets for a while. In time, they begin sticking with a career, saving money and starting to grow up. They gradually begin to accept life limits. No matter how tough we think we are, they are always someone tougher. If we don't teach our children to take a no, someone who loves them far less may take on the job. Someone tougher, someone stronger. And most parents would much rather spare having their children go through this suffering. The earlier we teach the limits, the better. A second, even more important reason why accepting the limits of others is important for kids is this. Heeding others' boundaries helps children to love. At its heart, the idea of respecting others' boundaries is a basis for empathy or loving others as we would like to be loved. Children need to be given the grace of having their no respected and they need to learn to give the same grace to others. As they feel empathy for the needs of others, they mature and deepen in their love for God and others. We love because He first loved us. Say for example that your six-year-old accidentally but carelessly bonks you on the head hard with a softball. To ignore it or act like it did not hurt is to give the child the feeling that his actions have no impact. He can then avoid any sense of responsibility or awareness of others' needs or hurts. However, telling him, I know you did not do it on purpose, but that ball really hurt me. Try to be a little more careful. Helps him see without condemnation that he can hurt people he loves and that his actions do matter. If this principle isn't taught, it's difficult for children to grow up as loving people. Frequently, they become self-centered or controlling. At that point, God's pro pro program of maturity is more difficult. 
A client of mine had been trained by his family to ignore others' limits. His subsequent manipulation had landed him in jail for stealing. Yet this process, painful though it was, taught him empathy. I really never knew that other people had needs and hurts, he once explained to me. I was raised to concentrate on number one and when I began getting confronted on my lack of respect for others' needs, something happened inside. A space opened up inside my heart for others. I did not ignore my own needs but for the first time I saw progress. I actually started feeling guilty about how my actions have hurt my wife and family. Did he have a long way to go? Absolutely, but he was on the right road. Learning boundaries later in life was a start to becoming an authentically, biblically loving person. Seasonal Boundaries – Age Appropriate Limits Training If this was the first chapter you turned to when you glanced over the table of contents, chances are you are a parent. Chances are also that you may be experiencing boundary difficulties with your children. Perhaps you are reading this simply in an effort to prevent problems. But more likely, you are in some pain from which you need relief. Your newborn won't strip, stop shrieking. Your toddler runs the household. Your elementary school student has behavioral problems at school. Your junior high kid smarts off. Your high schooler is drinking. All of these issues indicate possibly boundary problems. And this section provides an outline on the age-appropriate boundary task your children should be learning. As parents, we need to take into consideration our children's developmental needs and abilities to avoid asking them to do something they can't do or to avoid asking too little of them. Below are the basic tasks for the different stages of childhood. For more detailed information on birth to age 3, refer to chapter 4 on how boundaries are developed in childhood. Birth to 5 months At this stage, the newborn needs to establish an attachment with mother, dad, or the primary caregiver. A sense of belonging, of being safe and welcome are the tasks that the child needs to accomplish. Setting limits is not as much as an issue here as providing security for the infant. The only real boundary here is a soothing presence of the mother. She protects the infant. Mom's job is to help her newborn contain intense, frightening and conflicting feelings. Left by themselves, infants are terrorized by their aloneness and lack of internal structure. For centuries, mothers, including Mary, Jesus' mother, have swaddled their babies or wrapped cloths tightly around them. While swaddling keeps the baby's body heat regulated, the tri trappings also help the infant feel safe, a sort of external boundary. The baby knows where he or she begins and ends. When newborns are undressed, they often panic about the loss of structure around them. Some well-meaning Christian teachers call for infant training theories that schedule the feeding and holding of infants. These techniques try to teach an infant not to cry or demand comfort because the child is in control instead of the parent or because that demand is evidence of child's selfish, sinful nature. These theories can be horribly destructive when not understood biblically or developmentally. The screaming four-month-old child is trying to find out whether the world is a reasonable safe place or not. She is in a state of deep terror and isolation. She hasn't learned to feel comfort when no one is around. To put her on the parent's schedule instead of her own for holding and feeding is to condemn the innocent, as Jesus said. These teachers say their programs are biblical because they work. When I stop picking her up from her crib at night, my four-month-old stop crying, they'll say. That may be true, but another explanation for the cessation of crying is infant depression, a condition in which the child gives up hope and withdraws. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Teaching delay of gratification shouldn't begin until after the first year of life when a foundation of safety has been established between baby and mother. Just as grace always precedes truth, attachment must come before separation. 5-10 to 10 months As we learned in chapter 4, children in the last half of the first year of life are in the hatching phase. They are learning that mother and I are in the same. There's a scary, fascinating world out there that babies literally call, crawl toward. 
Though they have tremendous dependency needs, infants are beginning to move out of their oneness with their mom. To help their children develop good boundaries during this stage, parents need to encourage attempts at separateness while still being the anchors that child clings to. Allow your child to be fascinated with people and objects, objects other than you. Make your home a safe place for your baby to explore. Helping your children hatch, however, doesn't mean neglecting the deep attachment necessary for their internal foundation, their rootedness and groundedness. This is still an infant's primary work. You need to carefully tend to your child's needs for bonding and emotional safety while at the same time allowing the child to look outward beyond you. Many mothers find this transition from their child's love affair with them to the big wild world difficult. The loss of such a deep intimacy is great, especially after the time spent in pregnancy and childbirth. The responsible mother, however, will strive to get her own closeness needs met by other adults in her life. She will encourage the hatching of her baby, knowing she is preparing him or her to be equipped to leave and clean. At this point, most infants don't yet have the ability to understand and respond appropriately to the word no. Keeping them out of danger by picking them up and removing them from unsafe places is the best route. 10 to 18 months. At this practicing stage, your baby begins not only by talking but also walking and the possibilities stretch out before her. The world is this child's oyster and she spends a lot of time finding ways to open it up and play with it. Now, she has the emotional and cognitive ability to understand and respond to the word no. Boundaries become increasingly important during this stage, both having and hearing limits. Allowing the no muscle to begin developing is crucial at this age. No is your child's way of finding out whether taking responsibility for her life has good result or whether no causes someone to withdraw. As parents, learn to rejoice in your baby's no. At the same time, you have the delicate task of helping your child see that she is not the center of the universe. There are limits in life. There are consequences for scribbling on doors and screaming in church. Yet, you need to do this without quenching the sense of excitement and interest in the world that she has been developing. 18 to 36 months. The child is now learning the important task of taking responsibility for a separate yet connected soul. The practicing child gives way to the more sober child who is realizing that life has limits but that being separate does not mean that we can't be attached. In this phase, the following abilities or goals. The ability to be emotionally attached to others without giving up a sense of self and one's freedom to be apart. The ability to say appropriate no's to others without fear of loss of love. The ability to take appropriate no's from others without withdrawing emotionally. At 18 to 36 months old, the child needs to learn to be autonomous. She wants to be free of parental rule, but this desire is conflicted by her deep dependence on her parents. The wise parent will help her gain a sense of individualism and accept her loss of omnipotence, but without losing attachment. To teach a child boundaries at this stage, you need to respect her, know wherever whenever and wherever appropriate, yet maintain your own firm no. It's easy for you to try to win all the skirmishes, but there are simple, simply too many. You will end up losing the war because you have lost the big picture, the attachment. Don't waste your energy trying to control a random whirlwind. Pick your battles carefully and choose the important ones to win. Wise parents will rejoice in children's fun times, but we will constantly, sorry, consistently and uniformly keep solid limits with the practicing child. At this age, children can learn the rules of a house as well as the consequences for breaking them. One workable process of discipline is listed below. 1. First infraction. Tell the child not to color on the bed sheet. Try to help the child meet her need in another way using a coloring book or a pad of plain paper to crayon on or inst on instead of a bed sheet for example. S two, second infraction. Again, tell the child no and state the consequence. She will need to take a time out for one minute or lose her crayons for the rest of the day. 
3. Third infraction. Administer the consequences explaining why, then give the child a few minutes to be angry and separate from parents. 4. Comfort and reconnection. Hold and comfort the child, helping her reattach with you. This helps her differentiate between consequences and a loss of love. Painful consequences should never include a loss of connection. 3 to 5 years. During this phase, sorry, during this phase, children move into a period of sex role development. Each child identifies with the same sex parent. Little boys want to be like dad and little girls like mom. They also develop competitive feelings towards the same parent, wishing to marry the opposite sex parent, defeating the same sex parent in the process. They are preparing for adult sex roles later in life. Boundary work by parents is important here. Gently but firmly, mothers need to allow their daughters to identify and to compete. They must also deal with the possessiveness of their sons, letting them know that, I know you would like to marry mom, but mom's married to dad. Fathers have to do the same job with their sons and daughters. This helps children learn to identify with the opposite sex parent and take on appropriate characteristics. Parents who fear the budding sexuality of their children will often become critical of these intense longings. Their own fear may cause them to attack or to shame their child, causing her to re repress her sexuality. At the other extreme, the needy parent will sometimes emotionally or even physically seduce the child of the opposite sex. The mother who tells her son that, Daddy doesn't understand me, you are the only one who can, is ensuring years of confusion about sex roles for her son. Mature parents need to keep a boundary between allowing sex role typing to emerge and keeping the lines between parent and child clear. 6 to 11 years. During what is called lat latency or the years of industry, the child is preparing for the upcoming thrust into adolescence. These years are the last two years of childhood. They are important for learning task orientation through schoolwork and play and for learning to connect with same-sex peers. An extremely busy time for work and friends, this period carries its own boundary task for parents. Here, you need to help your kids establish the fundamental of tasks doing homework, house chores and product projects. They need to learn planning and the discipline of keeping at a job until it's finished. They need to learn such boundary work as delay of gratification, goal orientation and budgeting time. 11 to 18 years. Adolescence, the final step before adulthood, involves important tasks such as sexual maturation and a sense of solidifying identity in any surrounding, career leanings and love choices. It can be a frightening yet exciting time for both child and parents. By this point, the de-parenting process should have begun. Things are beginning to shift between you and your youngster. Instead of controlling your child, you influence her. You increase her freedom as well as responsibility. You renegotiate restrictions, limits and consequences with more flexibility. All of these changes are like the countdown of a NASA space shuttle. You are preparing for the launch of a young adult into the world. Wise parents keep the imminent, imminent catapulting of their teens into society in the back of their minds at all times. The question they must always struggle with is no longer how can I make them behave but rather how can I help them survive on their own. Teens need to be setting their own relational scheduling values and money boundaries as much as possible and they should suffer real life consequences when they cross their boundaries. The 17 year old who is still disciplined with TV and phone restrictions may have real problems at college in one year. Professor, deans and residence hall assistants don't impose these kind of restrictions. They resort to tactics such as failing grades, suspension and expulsion. If you are a parent of a teen who doesn't have boundary training, you may feel at a loss about what to do. You need to begin at whatever point your teens are. When their ability to say and hear no is deficient, Clarifying house rules and consequences can often help in the last few years before the youth leaves home. Symptoms such as the following, however, might indicate a more serious problem. Isolation of the teen from family members, depressed mood, rebellious behavior, 
continual conflict in family, wrong type of friends, school problems, eating disorders, alcohol use, drug use, suicidal ideas or behavior. Many parents observing these problems react with either too many boundaries or too few. The true strict parent runs the risk of sorry runs the risk of alienating the almost adult from the home connection. The too lenient parent wants to be the child's best friend at a time the teen needs someone to respect. At this point, parents should consider consulting a therapist who understands teen issues. The stakes are simply too high to ignore professional help. Types of discipline. Many parents are confused by how to teach children to respect boundaries. They read countless books and articles on spanking, timeouts, restrictions and allowances. While this question is beyond the scope of this book, a few thoughts may help organize the searching parent. Consequences are intended to increase the child's sense of responsibility and control over his life. Discipline that increases the child's sense of helplessness isn't helpful. Dragging a 16-year-old girl to class doesn't build the internal motivation she will need in two years when she is in college. A system of rewards and consequences that help her choose school for her own benefit has much better possibilities for success. Consequences must be age appropriate. You need to think through the meaning of your discipline. Spanking, for example, humiliates and angers a teenager. However, administered correctly, it can help build structure for a four-year-old. Consequences must be related to the seriousness of the infraction. Just as the penal system has different prison stays for different crimes, you must be able to distinguish between minor and severe infractions. Otherwise, severe penalties become meaningless. A client once told me, I got whippings for little things and for big things. So I started getting more involved in big things. It just seemed more efficient. Once you have been sentenced to death, you don't have much to gain by being good. The goal of boundaries is an internal sense of motivation with self-induced consequences. Successful parenting means that our kids want to get out of bed and go to school, be responsible, be empathic and be caring because that's important to them, not because it's important to us. It's only when love and limits are a genuine part of the child's character that true maturity can occur. Otherwise, we are raising compliant parents, sorry, compliant parrots who will in time self-destruct. Parents have a sober responsibility teaching their children to have an internal sense of boundaries and to respect the boundaries of others. It's sober because the Bible says it's sober. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. There are certainly no guarantees that our training will be heeded. Children have the responsibility to listen and learn. The older they are, they, the more responsibility they have. Yet, as we learn about our own boundary issues, take responsibility for them and grow up ourselves, we increase our kids' chances to learn boundaries in an adult world in which these abilities will be sorely needed every day of their lives. Okay all, let's end up for today. In the coming session, we'll try to understand what the author talks about boundaries and work. Thank you for continuously listening to our recordings. Have a wonderful day.